Good morning, Jill, and thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us. Um, and uh, congratulations on your appointment as chair. This is really exciting in our industry. And I'd uh, just like you to give us a quick intro of where you've come from, how you got involved in the exhibition industry. Thanks, Jax, and thanks for inviting me to the session today. It's, it's an absolute pleasure. Sure, going back many, many years now, when after I graduated from varsity, I worked full time for nine months to save to go overseas. And I moved overseas to the UK and I lived there for five years. And through various kind of career paths and, and avenues, I eventually ended up in the optometric industry. And when I came back to South Africa, when I was able to work after my son was a little bit older, my first son was born, I naturally progressed back into the optometric industry and worked there for a couple of years in Durban, in Musgrave Centre. I met somebody and he bought a hardware in Matuba Tuba, which is just outside of St. Lucia, about 45 minutes from Richards Bay. And we moved there and we ran the hardware for a couple, hardware for a couple of years. And eventually we decided to move to Johannesburg for various reasons, personal, and I was attacked in the house as well. So it, it started not to feel like home anymore around then. I was feeling that the environment was quite threatening. So it, my then husband's daughter was also needing to have her dad around. So we moved to Johannesburg and I actually bought a training franchise. And that's what got me into the marketing sales and training side of, of the industry. And I pursued that for a couple of years. It was quite grueling because the, most of the interviews for your bread and butter market, which was your students, happened in the evenings. And obviously having a young family, it became quite taxing. So eventually what happened was I signed up for a recruitment agency and they introduced me to Wolfgang Striebeck, who ran International Fairs and Exhibitions, which was one of the, the big organizers back in the day. And I joined Wolfgang. I think he only chose me because I did German at Varsity, and he's obviously German. Um, I could only say my, my donkey has a brown saddle. That was about as far as I could get with my German and a couple of um, greetings. But need, needless to say, I joined his, his team and was involved in shows like Tell.com and Plastics and Lifestyle Exhibitions and eventually Comdex. To cut a long story short, the business did not survive, um, mainly due to reasons of convex. And an opportunity came up at Z Displays, which was a sister company to Shell Systems. And that was on the contracting side. And I joined and it was quite an eye opener. It was very, very different from the organizing side. It was very challenging and obviously quite a technical environment. But eventually, Z Displays and Shell, Shell Systems amalgamated to form Oasis Innovations, which is now known today as GL Events. And in 2010, myself and my business partner, who's also my husband, Andrew, decided to open Concept G Exhibitions and Events. And two years later, we opened Blue Group, which is an agency-based company. And that's, that's really me in a nutshell. Oh, wow. And how our industry has evolved since then. Truly, Absolutely. truly amazing. And then how did you become involved in the association, in EXA? So I actually joined the, the EXA board in 2017. And that was at the point and the cusp of where the organizers were moving across and, and formulating EXO. And I think there were, there were a few people that were quite worried about EXA at the time to say, what, what is the association going to look like going forward now that the organizers have departed? Where does this leave us, um, et cetera, et cetera. So what we did is myself and Doug, we did a lot of work in terms of the, dare I call it, the, the transformation of EXA. And um, we, we spent a lot of time developing what, what would be the best benefits and, and attributes for our, our members going forward. What would be the value proposition? And how can we take EXA forward and, and keep it as a strong body bearing in mind that the suppliers, the venues, and the, the agency bodies that formed the EXA membership were quite large in volume at the time. So we had the strength of numbers to work with, and we basically evolved from there. What we had to do was do a lot of cost cutting with EXA, 
and we got down, we got the fat lady down to a very thin lady, and we, we managed it on a skeleton staff and a skeleton team. And then eventually we started to open up and to start looking for an association manager. And that's where the partnership came in with Bright Giants, Mark John, who um, studied with Doug actually back in the day. And I think that's, that had its um, the value in terms of getting the EXA website off the ground and refreshed. And in terms of digitalization and, and creating that platform um, and value proposition for EXA members, it was great. But what they were missing was the human connection. And we found that going to digital wasn't necessarily what the members needed. And we weren't really ready for it as, as, a, as a sector in the industry. So that's when we started interviewing and we found Leanne and she became our association manager. And the one thing about Leanne is that it's all about the in-person contact. She's very personable, she's very amicable and she, the, the members absolutely love her. The staying in touch with members became more important, funny enough, prior, prior to COVID. And then we were forced into this digital situation with COVID. I was appointed at the end of June and there's a lot of work to be done and I've got a lot of good ideas for EXA and that's why these, these industry reciprocity agreements are very, very important because we all get together and we, we share, we are like-minded professionals and we share ideas and we brainstorm how we can make the landscape look different and orchestrate it that we, we all benefit as, as an industry and a community. And tell us now with COVID-19, um, has this increased uh, the collaboration between the associations? Uh, because at one time it seemed a little bit uh, fragmented and now there just seems to be a, a unity. Tell us about that. It definitely is, Jax. You know, from the point of view, as you say, it was quite fragmented. And when EXO changed, when the organizers moved away and formed EXO, it was, it was definitely very fragmented then. But I think there's nothing like a crisis to bring everybody together. And I, I say it not in a flippant way, but that's when people actually put their brain power together and they decide not to take it lying down and to, to do whatever can be done to find the solutions for the way forward for the greater interests of the industry, which is obviously prevalent and almost for our success and longevity going forward. So when, when the disastrous events and exhibitions started canceling on that fateful Friday in March, the industry got together at the Ticket Pro Dome in Rainburg, in Johannesburg. And that was where the, the SA Events Council actually was formulated. And as we speak today, we're up to 13 associations on the SA Events Council. And obviously EXA is a founding member, or one of the founding members of the SA Events Council. So our objectives obviously were to provide the strength of an industry recognized body or council, as it were, when it comes to policymakers and stakeholders, because those are the conversations that you need to have. And our objectives were threefold. First of all, we wanted to gain recognition for our sector because for the longest time we've been lumped under the auspices of tourism and we've been classified as, as live events or mass gatherings. And while it is important to know that the SA Events Council is representative of all aspects of the, the industry community, including live events and large gatherings of, of millions of people or thousands of people at concerts or live festivals, What's important to know is that government never really saw our relevance and our placement in, in the terms of the economy, I think, until COVID-19. I think there was an awareness, but again, it's about education and showing them that we're not, we, we cannot be classified as a church gathering or a, a festival of people getting together. We, we're more than that. So the threefold objective was obviously to get that recognition for our sector and to basically start talking to them about a green light phased approach towards reopening the sector. And with that, and with the, the then safety council, the reopening guidelines were formulated. We didn't want to wait for government to say, okay, these are the guidelines and this is the way we have to do it to reopen. We wanted to, to basically spearhead that and to put it forward because it's what we know and what we understand. Our whole industry revolves around health and safety and well-being whether we're talking customers, whether we're talking visitors, attendees, participants, delegates, 
everybody is, is factored into that. So we just took it a step further in terms and in, in relation to COVID-19 and obviously looking at international best practice and standards and what everybody else was doing in terms of, of their reopening and phased approach. We realized that the government wasn't going to say, right, so on the 1st of October, everybody's open and everybody can run as, as normal. We knew that it wasn't going to happen. So we went with the, the phased approach. And then the third trajectory that we wanted to put forward was obviously to, to show them the plight of our industry in terms of the financial distress that has been very widespread and devastating and has resulted in suicides and, and deaths and stress that we, we're never going to get that time and that, that those people or those companies or freelancers, whoever they were, we're never going to get that back. And the industry is forever changed. The landscape is forever changed because of it. But what we want to do is to obviously get that phased approach opening and we've achieved it. We've been heard. But it doesn't mean that we can operate as normal because that doesn't really exist in this brand new world. It's just so interesting and it's been such an interesting journey to watch how collaboration has really worked. I mean, from, I think you started with seven associations and now you're up to 13. And I just think this is such an amazing uh, example of how collaboration can really work. As a leader in the industry, how do you see maybe Exa and Aella collaborating together? What can Aella do or what can we do together? In terms of the association component that is the foundation of the relationship between Exa and the Aella, obviously from an Exa point of view, we have got a situation where everything we subscribe to in terms of our vision and our mission is about best practice, quality, delivery, success of the event, success from the point of view of um, customers being able to engage with like-minded professional bodies, whether they be freelancers, whether they be exhibition companies, service providers, Everybody has a requirement in terms of putting the, the exhibition or the event together. And when we looked at the reciprocity agreement that was on the table, we also saw that Ayala subscribes to operational excellence and serving well beyond the, the industry expectations in terms of standards, care and safety. So I think the two associations are very similar in the mission and the vision and in terms of what we want to bring to the party and for our members. And what we have found as EXA over the years that international partnerships are crucial to our success. We are a South Africa, we seem to, or in the past we were considered as the, the gateway to Africa. And we seem to be quite apart from the rest of the world. But what COVID has shown us is that we are definitely very, very close. It's all about geography and location. And all we have to do is jump on a Zoom call and provided we've got good connectivity for the day, we, we can actually engage and connect. And what is important for us when we consider reciprocity agreements is that we look for like-minded association and bodies that have the, the aspects of quality, service, delivery, care, and safety as paramount to their, their obviously to their traits and to their culture. And it's the same with, with EXA. And what we're seeing with X and Yaela is that there is a networking, there's a referral benefit in terms of the reciprocity agreement. And we're very excited about it and we can only see it going forward in terms of, of the different attributes that the two associations bring. We are also, we're very excited to uh, have that uh, MOU in place. So thank you. Being a woman in a leadership role, have you seen an increase in women in leadership during this COVID at all? Actually, Jackie, I've seen it over the years of being in the industry, which is now, I think, 23 years. When I started at Z Displays, it was very male dominated. And I actually considered in the first few days of joining that it perhaps wasn't such a good idea. But being the type of person that I am, my mom is a very, very strong woman and she, she taught me to be very, very strong and to, to focus on one thing and to make it work and to be successful. And 
there were tears of frustration. There were there were there was anger. There was resentment. There was why is this happening to me? Why are they saying these things? How do they think they can get away with this? And I'm talking about very, very real sexist comments and goading and constant, constant put downs and belittling and if you're a woman, you can't do this or this is a male industry, haven't you noticed? And what I decided to do was to stay the distance. I held my own and through grace and fortitude, I survived. And I was very privileged in my years at, o as at Oasis Innovations to be able to train and to mentor a couple of young ladies that have now spearheaded themselves through the industry and have become very, very successful in what they're doing. And that is one of my passions. And it's certainly one of the, the objectives that I would like to take forward for EXA is to have that mentorship and that, that go-to place for women to be able to share ideas, gain knowledge, gain best practice, how to deal with certain situations when they do encounter it. Because I think it is still out there from time to time. But I do think that in terms of, of industry leaders and where we are as women, our counterparts in the industry are, are definitely, the eyes are on us and they're looking to us. And we've got a lot of respect and a lot of support from the greater industry community because of what we bring to the party. So I'm very excited about it and I can only see it getting stronger. And one of our, our goals as EXA is to, to obviously take forward the, that women in leadership scenario and obviously attract people, youngsters to our industry. Because that's where we short, we, we're falling short a little bit because of the long hours and the strenuous work and, and the demands of our industry that the youngsters tend not to want to gravitate towards it. And we need to change that narrative and we need to show them that it is a very rewarding industry and that there is so much potential for everybody across the board, not just women. Absolutely. Multicultures, uh, diversity, just uh, really, I think it's exciting times to be able to um, change that uh, horizon. Um, so it is really, it's great. Uh, I think Ella's doing very much the same is um, putting on their sustainability program that there's diversity and they're pushing towards that which is really exciting to see. If we gave you a looking glass into the future how would the new normal look like? This is a, this is a very <laughs> it's a hard question, question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> It is a hard question, but it, you know what? It's, it's an interesting one and it's very relevant to, to what we're going through. Firstly, we've been given, we've been heard by government and we've been given the green lights go for a phased approach. So right now we're allowed to open to a certain amount of packs, a limit of 250 packs inside and 500 outside. The reality of the situation is between now and December, I really don't think any organizer has got enough time to put an exhibition, a trade show, or an event together. So, and we knew that. We knew that when we were lobbying over the last five to six months as the, as the events council, we knew that this year would not possibly yield any potential trade shows. But what we wanted to do was to be able to achieve a time of confidence in our sector so that the corporates can start engaging with us. Because what's been missing over the last five to six months is sales. And that's why our industry is in the situation that it's in, in terms of finances and devastation. So, and the loss, that impact and that loss of, 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 of jobs, of businesses, some businesses have closed their doors, possibly permanently, and may never come back again. So what we, what we needed to do was to, to get to a, a phase where we could hold proof of concept events or conferences or confixes where we invite the corporates and we start to engage with them to build that confidence, to work towards the brand new world that we're trying to achieve here. Once we've got that, they will start to plan for next year. Bearing in mind that a lot of businesses, whether we're talking corporates, organizations, have been doing a lot of their own marketing, budgeting, social media in-house. And it's partly because of budget restraints or because we want to wait and see what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how long the industry is going to take to open. 
we don't know how long we're going to, it's going to take to get to level one and eventually level zero. So people have been holding back on budgets and that obviously affects us as an industry. So what we need to do is we need to obviously start to build that confidence and we need to look to what has been missing over the last few months and what have we missed? We've missed the human connection and we need to build on that. So first of all, we need to build the morale of people. We need to instill confidence. We need to start engaging, connecting, getting together like we are tomorrow. Hopefully Durban as well in terms of EXO is getting their group together so that we can start having these conversations and say to, guys, to the guys, hey, we're in the home straits. Now, what does this brand new world look like? So my personal opinion is that the brand new world is, is a brand new world. It's exactly that. We don't know what it's going to look like. I was asked recently, do I think that exhibitions will be more of a sustainable infrastructure scenario? I don't know. I can't answer that. It's going to very much depend on how much build up time we have for that event or exhibition. What does that exhibition look like? Is it a series of six rooms that are split to make up the 250 people? Is it a case of having a, a loading schedule in the loading bay? Is it, sorry, my phone's talking to me in the background. It is the third largest island of the great. I talk, with, <laughs> I talk with my hands, so Siri starts to get excited thinking that I'm wanting to learn something about the Caribbean. <laughs> um, it's because it's connected to the watch, you see it's all in sync. So, so basically what we're saying is that the conversations and the narrative around the brand new world still need to, to happen. And how it happens is, is how we get together and we engage and we start connecting and we start to build those, those blocks. What I can tell you is that hybrid events are a very real scenario. And particularly in South Africa, there was over the last five to six months, a lot of skepticism around virtual and online. But every organizer, every platform, every sector is going to have an online or a virtual element composed to whatever they do. And the reason is that even if we do open international borders, we still need to build the confidence. We still need people to feel, okay, it's cool to travel. Okay, it's cool to go outdoors. It's cool to get together. And having the restrictions still of the 250 packs indoors, 500 packs outdoors, we need to work around that and we need to structure the narrative that will basically enable us to all have a little bit of a, a piece of the pie as it were working towards the brand new world. So in terms of the, the online and the virtual, at the moment it's called a hybrid event, which is a combination of in-person and, and a virtual. The challenges that are there, and it's international, it's not only local, is the connectivity side of it. So big data is very, very important. And what we're saying is as industry associations and, and councils, maybe what we need to do is to spearhead solutions to the technology companies to say, hey guys, we have been escalated into digitalization through COVID-19. Obviously the, the platforms that are existing cannot cope with what we demand as an audience on a virtual and online platform. What can we do to circumvent that and to enhance it? Because big data needs a big platform to work 99, at least 99% of the time. And really what, what is going to happen is that events will will be hybrid. There will be a, an in-person physical element to it. And then there will be the online. The challenges that go with that are obviously revolve around scheduling. The timing of the event is going to be very important, particularly when you want internationals to participate because there are time zones. So you need to be very strategic in your planning, probably even more so than you would with a normal event. And when you were an organizer or an event planner before COVID, that was already difficult in itself. So there, there are a lot of challenges, but the most important thing that we have to do is to take it a step at a time and to know that we're all learning and that we are going to fail. We can't be crucified and penalized for failing because we're, we're all learning. We're all developing this together, this brand new world that we see. What, and I think what we need to do is to start assigning value and, and quality and monetary value to, to what it is in terms of our skill set and what we've developed over the last few months. 
I also see that a lot more pivoting is going to take place. So when it comes to venues that have been traditionally expecting visitors of between five and 14,000 people over a weekend or over the time of the trade show, whatever it might be, those, those events need to look different and they need to be broken up into manageable segments that we can manage with the restrictions, with the safety regulations and protocols that we've put in place that we can still have the event but it, it's very different from what we've known traditionally. It's going to take patience and perseverance and practice Definitely. to get us uh, into the new era. The most important thing, Jax, is that the, the audience that is coming, whether they're international, whether they're local, some locals may choose to do the online and not visit in person, and that's absolutely fine. But what we need to make sure that whoever is putting the event together from an organizer or the event planner point of view, it has to be, it's got to have a purpose. It can't just be a get together for the sake of getting together. We have to have a purpose for the event. We have to have new stuff. We've got to excite, we've got to inspire, we've got to ignite because otherwise you're going to lose that audience and understanding the audience and understanding their needs and where they are right now in today's COVID world is going to be very critical to the success of that event. And every element of the industry, every sector of the industry is instrumental in making that happen and making sure that that picture of that brand new world looks good. And while it might not have the same monetary value attached to it as traditional exhibitions and what we've known, we need to work with what we've got. And that's really come out of COVID-19. Work with what you've got, use your talents and find a way to make your situation work and be solutions driven. And be open-minded, obviously, knowing and understanding your customers. What are their needs right now? It's not the same as it was in February this year. I can guarantee that. Tom, thank you so much for your time. Really, really, it's always such a treat to chat to you. And I really thank you for chatting to us today and uh, look forward to exciting times ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great Thanks day. for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.